Mohammed Amin never left his camera. The fact that he could shoot both video and still simultaneously, to me to this day is still astonishing. During my wedding day, I was on the street covering riot because he told me wedding can wait, but news can't wait. I don't feel happy doing assignments like these, filming people dying. You just see this and you feel this is going to get the message across stronger. An archive of more than four million images. Still and moving. It's a story of Africa. A celebration of its wonders. And a chronicle of its wars. A record of its finest hours and of its utter follies. The archive is almost entirely the work of one man, Muhammad Amin, described as Africa's greatest photojournalist. In a career spanning four decades, he covered almost every major news story on the continent, chalking up scoop upon scoop upon scoop. Muhammad Amin was able to scoop every journalist. I think for three reasons, three major reasons. One, simple enough, Muhammad Amin never left his camera. Wherever he went, you saw Mohammed Amin with a camera. His camera was with him, I think, in the toilet, everywhere. Secondly, he was a born journalist. He knew when he saw an event that this would be a major event. And the third reason, I think, why he scooped other journalists, he knew what constituted a good, newsworthy picture. Not only did he know that this is an event, but within the event, he knew that that particular uh, happening needs to be captured. For Muhammad, or Mo as he became known, getting the story first was not just a goal, it was an obsession. He wanted to be first, he always wanted to have the scoop. He wanted to be the only one with the pictures, and there are many, many incidences that I heard of from other journalists where they say, you know, he used uh, extremely unethical uh, uh, methods in order to make sure that nobody else got the, the story except him. He was uh, a force of nature, if you like, in pursuit of a story or a picture. He was a tsunami and nothing would, nothing would stand in his way. If anybody, anybody came close to even getting onto what he called his patch, then uh, he would he would even explode even more. Mo expected the same commitment to the job from those who worked for him. During my wedding day, I was on the street covering riot because he told me wedding can wait, but uh, news can't wait. So we were with him on the street, running up and down. Suddenly during lunch hour, he said, OK, now we are on break. We can go back to your place and uh, have a fun. So I, we went back there, and then I put on my suit, and uh, we start celebrating with the guests. And then after 45, one hour, he said, let's go back to work. The determination and focus that were to earn Mo fame as Africa's greatest photojournalist were with him from his early days. He was born in 1943 in Eastleigh, a deprived area of the Kenyan capital Nairobi.
His father was a poor railway engineer of Indian descent. Mo was the second of his seven children. You know, I come from a, a very poor family and, uh, you know, I was never uh, born on a bed of roses. I've gone through, uh, grown by eating charcoal from gutters and so on and so forth. That, I don't know if that is, that is the reason. Perhaps that is, that is uh, something, you know, in me that uh, tries to get the message across uh, more strongly, trying to understand other people's suffering. In the early 1950s, his father's job took the family to Dar es Salaam, commercial capital of the then British rule Tanganyika, now Tanzania. Mo was obsessed with photography even as a boy. He saved up for two years to buy his first camera, a box brownie, at the age of 11. At school, he was an active member of the photographic club and spent his spare time snapping student activities. Showing a canniness with money for which he was later to become well known, he sold the pictures to his friends at a profit. So sure was Mo of his chosen career that at 19, much to his parents' horror, he quit school and set himself up as a freelance photographer. He called his fledgling company Camera Pics. It was now the early 1960s and there was no shortage of news events to cover. The winds of change were sweeping through the continent. There was the end of the colonial rule. African leaders were taking over their countries. There wasn't much international media presence here, so being a local African allowed him to actually get access to places and to people that I don't think anyone else would have gotten access to. Mo's very first scoop took him off the mainland coast to the spice island of Zanzibar, where there were rumors of a coup. The island's airport had been closed, but this was no deterrent to the resourceful Mo. He hitched a ride on a dhow and was the first to take pictures of John Okello, who led the Zanzibar revolution in 1964. Back in Zanzibar the following year, he got an even more sensational scoop. Pictures of a secret military training camp with advisors from what was then the Soviet Union and East Germany. The images made news worldwide, but landed Mo in Zanzibar's notorious Kilimamigu prison. It's said he cried just three times in his life, and the first time was here. He was 22 years old. He had just started his career. It was almost a baptism of fire for him. He was beaten. He was tortured. It was a really bad experience for him. Uh, he lost 28 pounds in weight in, in 28 days. It was the defining point in his life, I think, where he could have just given up this profession and gone and done something else. But instead, I think it hardened him and, and made him more determined. After his release from prison, Mo was deported. He headed back to the Kenyan capital where he started afresh to build up his business. The fact that he could shoot both video and still simultaneously, to me to this day is still astonishing. In his early days he used to work for different agencies and not tell those agencies that he was working for their rivals, but he obviously couldn't send them the same picture. So he would again rig up this contraption that would take the same picture but from different angles. So it looked like there were three photographers there as opposed to just him. So he could sell the same picture to three different people um, and, and make three times the amount of money. He was tough to negotiate with. When he brought his pictures, he wanted those pictures bought at a certain price. There, there you saw somebody who was uncompromising. He knew the quality of his work and he wanted a price for his pictures that went far, 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 far above the normal accepted prices we were paying for pictures at that time. But 
it was not all work and no play for the ambitious young photographer. In Tanzania, he'd met Dolly Kaki, sister of one of his friends and a fashion designer and model. Romance blossomed. And these pictures are all taken by Muhammad Amin. This, this was my first picture he took in the fashion show. First picture of mine. Amin was not uh, very good looking or he was not a handsome boy. But I thought he had a very good personality. He was charming. That's how I fell in love with him. <laughs> but there was a problem. Mo was from an orthodox Muslim family. Dolly was an Ismaili, one of the Aga Khan's followers. My family did not like that I should get married with Amin because they thought that he's not right for me. But uh, I was in love with him. We were so much in love with each other. The young couple continued to meet, and in October 1968, during one of Dolly's regular visits to Mo in Nairobi, they were married in secret. Two years later, their son Salim was born. I delivered Salim in Nairobi hospital. Same day or se second day, he went on a job. In the years that followed Mo's return to Kenya, events in Africa continued to make headlines and he made sure he was never far from the fray. His pursuit of news took him across the continent, from Nigeria in the west to the tiny island of Mauritius off the southeast coast. But it was back on his home turf in Nairobi that he was to get the next major exclusive of his career. On July the 5th, 1969, Kenyan politician Tom Mboya, tipped by many as a successor to the then president Jomo Kenyatta, was gunned down as he left a pharmacy in the city centre. Thanks to a tip-off and the speed of his response, Mo and his cameras were on the scene within minutes. An hour or so later, he was at the offices of the Nation newspaper. So here comes Mohammed Amin, sweating, I remember. And uh, he, was, he was offering the editor exclusive pictures. And when we looked at those pictures, it was impossible for us to believe what kind of pictures they were. They show Tom Boyer dying. It so happens that Mohammed Amin, after hearing Tom Boyer was shot, rushed to the scene and before they took Tom Boyer to Nairobi Hospital they obviously put him in an ambulance and Mohammed Amin got in that ambulance so he was taking pictures of Tom Boyer as they were trying to revive him he was then almost unconscious but he was not dead and so all the efforts those people were making to, to revive Tom Boyer were captured a very dramatic series of pictures. The images secured Mo's reputation as a photojournalist of note and won him his very first Cameraman of the Year award. He'd achieved another coup, but more exclusives were soon to follow. In 1971, Idi Amin hit the headlines when he seized power in Uganda in a military coup. The next big story was Idi Amin and his reign of terror. How he got to know him was a funny story in the sense that he, like every other journalist, wanted to get into Uganda when they heard about the fall of Milton Obote and called up the state house in Kampala and got the operator and said, you know, in his usual, dad's usual style, you know, let me speak to, to General Amin. And the operator is asking, well, you know, who are you? And he said, well, I'm Mohammed Amin. And 
the guy, the operator just put him straight through to India. And I think the operator just assumed that it was a relative. And dad ended up forming this, this interesting relationship with Edie. I wouldn't say it was a friendship, because I don't think Edie was anyone's friend, but it was a good acquaintance, it was a good connection. This good connection gave Mo unique access to Idi Amin's private world. But it also enabled him to reveal the shocking brutality of the so-called Butcher of Uganda, Making sure he wasn't named as the photographer who took these images, he exposed the mass murders and torture that took place during Idi Amin's eight-year rule. Connections were the key to many of Mo's successes. He made a point of knowing people in all the right places. He had that list of very impressive contacts. And the people Mohammed Amin knew mattered. And doors opened for him. No matter what you say about him, whether you say he was not a very likable person, doors opened. And the doors that opened for Mohammed Amin are the doors that matter. And they led to news. As Mo's work became increasingly known to editors around the world, commissions flowed in. Working alone, he was no longer able to cope with the number of assignments. He took on a small staff and camera pics grew. In the initial days, I mean, everyone was petrified. Mohammed, he would scream, shout, curse, swear. Right? He had absolutely no respect for anybody. <laughs> but in my opinion, this was the best way you'd actually get to learn because you had to be sharp. As well as cameraman, he was the company accountant and office manager. No job was too great or too small. Amin used to work, he started to work at home at around uh, 2 a.m. And then at 6 o'clock he will go to the office and then he will stay there up to like 8, 9 at night. That was every day, Sundays, holidays, Christmas Day. Uh, there, was no, there was no holiday, he never took a holiday. Uh, even if we went to the coast or we went, you know, we went somewhere for a vacation, he would be with his cameras, be up at, at uh, 2, 3 in the morning doing his paperwork, uh, be out at 5.30 to get the sunrise pictures because he knew he could sell those pictures at some point. Assignments regularly took Mo and his crew to some of the most dangerous places on the planet. From Britain's attempts to shore up its empire in the late 1960s to the long-running conflicts in South Sudan and Somalia. I was, I was doing about three, four trips into Somalia in a week. At one point I thought, hang on, I. I'm not functioning at all, I can't feel anything. And I went to the doctors and says, you are so stressed out, your, your BP is completely wrong. It's too high. So I got home and I, call, I called Mohammed and I said to him, uh, I've been told blood pressure is too high, I'm stressed out, I need to take a break for a week, and I've been given medication and told not even to drive. And Mohammed said to me, that's rubbish. What do you mean you've got stress? <laughs> that's a white man's disease. As well as across Africa, assignments took Mo to the Middle East and Asia. My contacts in Pakistan are invaluable at every level, especially the armed forces. They are still the people who make things happen in that country. But while the thrill of getting the story was supreme for Mo, for his young family left home alone, there were challenges. He was an absent father. I actually hardly ever saw him because he would be on the road probably seven or eight months of the year. So I never really got to see him. His work was his life. Not 
nothing, nothing, nothing mattered. Nothing mattered except his work. From the beginning, I, I knew that I'm going to be lonely all my life. Then in 1984 came an assignment that was to change Mo and his family's lives forever. He was commissioned by BBC television to travel to northern Ethiopia where there'd been reports of a famine. The BBC's Michael Burke was the reporter. Until then, access to the region had been blocked by the country's ruler, Mengistu Haile Mariam. For six months, Mo negotiated for permission to film. And finally, thanks to his contacts, this crew got in. It's one story that really has shaken me. I have seen a lot of horrors, wars, executions in the past, which, is, which has never bothered me. But I feel here is a situation where people are dying simply because there is no food, you know, something we take for granted in our normal lives. Among the hungry thousands who gathered here in 1984 was Gebra Maiden. People had to carry the bodies. How did they move all the bodies? Yeah, Mo and Michael Burke returned to Nairobi to edit the footage before sending their report to London. He came to the office and he was looking at it and there were tears in his eyes. When do you cry? When your heart becomes soft, then you want to cry. So it defected him. I don't feel happy doing assignments like these. Uh, I don't think anybody can feel happy uh, going and filming people dying. But in the business that we are in, uh, I feel myself that by actually going there and recording the events that are taking place, this is going to get the message across. Mo's images were broadcast on BBC television news in October 1984. The response was unprecedented. Among those who'd seen the news broadcast was Irish singer-songwriter Bob Geldof. He mobilised musicians in Britain and Ireland to record a song to raise money to relieve the famine. American artists quickly followed suit. Next came Live Aid, simultaneous charity concerts in the UK and America. They're estimated to have raised more than 200 million US dollars and helped save some 2 million lives. The world wanted to see the man whose images had inspired the event. Mo found himself mixing with some of the most famous and influential people on the planet. And awards and acclaim poured in. 
For the Ethiopian famine, he received dozens of, of international uh, television awards at different festivals. The, he won a BAFTA, uh, which is probably one of the biggest, the Royal Television Society, a Monte Carlo Award, dozens and dozens in, every, in almost every continent on earth. He was, he was honored. A lot of people uh, have commented that it, it did make him uh, a little bit more uh, arrogant than he was, but he had a big ego anyway, and so if you add fuel to that ego's fire, the ego became much bigger. 1984 famine story, it did good to him, but I don't know, it changed him also very much. He became very, very, very famous. But then my life went down because very, very pretty women were falling in love with him. <laughs> I don't blame him. So I just kept my mouth shut and he was doing whatever he wanted to. The worldwide impact of Mo's images had other consequences too. It did serve to uh, save uh, millions of lives because the international community responded very quickly and very generously to the uh, famine. Now in terms of negative impact, that image was indelibly imprinted on the minds of many people. And so for uh, many people, Ethiopia became the um, poster child of famine in Africa. The images had moved the world. It's hardly surprising that they affected the man who captured them too. Pre-Ethiopia 1984, a story was a story for him to get in first, out first, with the exclusive pictures and forget about and move on to the next story. Ethiopia and the famine fundamentally changed him because he started caring about a story. It is my responsibility in the little way that, that, you know, that I have the ability or the access to continue telling the world what is happening and to continue reminding that the problem hasn't gone away. Mo had only just turned 40 and years more of scoops and exclusives seemingly spread out before him. But events as dramatic as those in any story he'd ever covered were soon to happen in his own life and change things forever. The way he took it was incredible. He was a very, very tough guy. I think I've only seen Mohammed cry once. I think he got a sense of his own mortality. Most people were, I think, a little too scared, so I, I presume he's a very brave man. He must have thought, I'm going to get a great story out of it.